Tracking Jeff down for this project took months. When we finally got in touch with Jeff, he was tattooing at a shop in Chicago. So I made an appointment with him and got a tattoo. It's the artwork from Leviathan's album, Howl Mockery at the Cross. I guess he realized we were serious about getting him on camera, so he invited us out to his place in Oakland. Me with, I was 23, it's like barely any tattoos. Me getting tattooed by Horiyoshi in Japan by hand. Shit. I was on a soccer team called the Darth Vaders. Yeah. 1978. San Jose. Is that you right there? Yeah. Nice. Could we talk at all about growing up? It seemed like it took forever. I was born in Stanton, California, in a hospital in Stanton. Lived in Huntington Beach. Moved to San Jose right before first grade. Eighth grade, moved to Santa Cruz. Got kicked out of 10th grade in high school. Why'd you get kicked out of 10th grade? I'm a pain in the ass. I just kept getting in trouble, so. Then I ran away from home. My dad lived in Oakland, I ran away up there. Why did you leave your mom's house and go live with your dad? Because I got in trouble at school and I knew I was gonna be in for it. When I got home, I just didn't want to deal with it. You know, just, you know, right. the stepdad all that. Ah, uh, right, yeah. Went so you, you went up to live with your dad in Oakland? Yeah, that didn't work out. I became a ward of the court, which means that your parents don't want you at their houses, so you are in group homes. First group home I was in in San Francisco was run by this guy, Father, Father Gregory. He's a Greek Orthodox priest. And he was hiring guys straight out of SQ, you know, straight out of Quentin. San Quentin. To be counselors. These guys are getting us baked and showing us titty magazines, the whole bit, you know what I mean? Like, you know, shaking, you're shaking your head and going, no, but like at the time I was like, awesome. <laughs> this guy showed me how to roll a crutch. I'm smoking weed, awesome, you know, like so. Um, but looking back on you it, it's probably not. I mean, that the, does not make any sense. Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't. But he was ex-prisoners. He, he probably, you know, paid him, and you can eat as much as you want, or something, you know. And they were they were pretty fucked up. What was I? I think it was like just about to turn 16, and uh, I had fucked up the last one in San Francisco. I'd been in three in San Francisco, and this was the last straw. And they were going to send me to a boys' home in Modesto, and I was like, fuck that, and I just. Took off, took my skateboard, and went and stayed at friends' houses. Jeff spent the late 80s homeless, living on people's couches, all the while making a name for himself as a skater. He wound up in a bunch of skate magazines, and even on the cover of Nintendo's Skate or Die 2. I started skateboarding and getting good like right after street style, like Mark Gonzalez and Tommy Guerrero. I went to high school with Tommy Guerrero and those guys were just doing all this crazy stuff on the street. Then 1990 rolled around and Vert was out. It was all street. Like, so if you didn't skate street, you were out. So all these amazing Vert skaters had nothing, they had nowhere to go. But yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a great time. It was a great time. When he wasn't skating or getting busted for it, Jeff was designing skate graphics and logos. I sold this to Thunder Trucks. 91 for 50 bucks. They still use it, and I got no fucking money. I mean, considering the fact that it's their icon and they're still using it, where's my money? Back in late 80s, all I knew was um, how to play drums. That was my sole purpose in life at that time, my raison d'etre. And when did you first start playing in bands? Seriously, I started in 1989. How old were you? Oh, I was only 16. We were all into extreme metal, but it was like Black Death doing. We couldn't decide what we wanted to play. I wanted to play fast stuff. 
because it was all new to me. And our guitarist was into really slow, like Candlemas type stuff. And then another guitarist was into Testament and Metallica. So, it's just so just... it was just a real mishmash. Yeah. And um, it was probably because of those kind of bands and that kind of beginning that that made me realise, you know, going solo is definitely the more desirable way to go. So then I started um, teaching myself how to play guitar. In 95, I was ready to record. A Tragic Journey Towards the Light, that was the first album. It's not a demo like people think. It really is an album. It was like this serious conceptual thing. It had like lots of intros and a full length kind of piece that worked together, yeah. It was recorded using one stereo bouncing into another stereo. So we'd record the gu guitar track, then play it from A deck to B deck. While it was recording into B deck, I was using finger drums on the Casio keyboard in mono. And then we put that tape back into the first one again to do the vocals. So third time around, it had the, the three main instruments there. How did your sound change from Streetborg's first releases up until where you are now? In the early recordings, it was a lot faster sounding, more frantic, more urgent. Um, they were also the years that I used to take drugs. I used to smoke pot every day and take LSD occasionally and stuff like that. It was when I stopped doing that that I realised that those substances were actually clouding my vision. Because once I stopped doing that, I was able to create more emotional and depressive music and I wanted to go go that way. I don't know whether it's because it's a coincidence or what, but I just that was the way I wanted to go when, when I became straight. Now I've been straight for 10 years. Despite an unorthodox career path, Russell has a somewhat conventional life, but he also has these cloaks of black metal identity, Streborg and Sinana. They almost seem like outlets for expressing a point of view at odds with his day-to-day -day life. I'm a normal human being like everybody else, and I'm a father and a husband. That's when it draws the line that there's Russell there, and Sinana is, is like the entity for creating the music and the dark visions that I have. There's at times that, you know, it'll be one and the same, and other times that it definitely is so worlds apart. The real Struborg started when I lived here, 2000, turn of the millennium. By moving here, I could reflect on what it had been like living in a city and being around people all the time and all the rubbish I put up with. I just became recluse and I just cut all those problems out of my life and became semi-happy for doing so. artist that you are because of like all the long hours that you put in of like recording, practicing, creating all the time, you, you pretty much stay here and that's what you do. Yeah. And this was the way that you dealt with life is to just stay in, stay alone, record, create. Um, yeah, for a long time, you know, uh, I had nothing else. That's all, that, that's all I had. I mean, it's all I could count on. It's, a, it's the only way that I was able to count on myself, too, you know, so. And did you have, like, any jobs growing up? Did you, did you work? Yeah, I've, I've had a few, you know, on and off. I mean, I don't hold down jobs very well. Do you not like working because it takes away t from time about just recording? That's, that's the only part of being unemployed I want to talk about, you know, because okay. it's just like... Well. Scott's aversion to revealing anything too personal makes it impossible to figure out how or why he's carved this life out for himself. But it speaks volumes about his need to do everything on his own and create such brutal, compelling music. When did you first discover, like, you wanted to play music, you wanted to create? 
I just started doing it like probably after high school, you know. Were you, were, were you working with other people or did, we, did you always just work by yourself? Um, I used to work with, uh, with other people, but back then, like, no, nobody wanted to play black metal. And if you explain it to them, they, they just, you know, nobody wanted to play any kind of music like that. And so the people I would find were people that were n not really into it. And I would tell them, do it anyway. I even try to bribe people and, you know, play drums for a couple hours and I'll pay you some money or something. Like, it just didn't work. There was nothing I could do, you know, so. You never perform live. Is that, why, why don't you perform live? I know what I put into it. Um, and I know that that can't exactly be recreated live. The only way it would work is I'd have to find session people and I don't really like doing that. I don't like, I mean, it's just part of the, uh, one of the things about metal, uh, especially these days, black metal is just like a lot of bands and musicians, they just recycle the hell out of each other and um, I'm not into that. It's not the kind of band you, you go to see. It's not like some rowdy, beer drinking kind of music. That's pretty much why. And I mean, I have another problem too is like, I do a lot of, songs so I don't really remember how to play half the shit I write. What appeals to you about coming here? It's close to absolute quiet and it's as dark as outdoors can get. It's depressing in a way, you know, I like at night. It's just uh I don't know, it's like, I don't know what makes it more depressing, the people or the emptiness of it. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure of that, really, you know. <laughs> but I come here sometimes, you know. So, I mean, do you just like, do you just not like people? So. I, I just never understood people. I don't think they really ever understood me. And I, I don't have, I don't have anything in common with any, very few people at least. I don't really see any worth in a lot of people. I find human beings most of the time to be really arrogant with nothing to be arrogant about. In the back of my mind, I'm always trying to think of ways to knock them off their high horse if I could, you know. Um, but at the same time, when I meet somebody who I think is going to be a piece of shit like everybody else, and they turn out to be a really interesting, amazing person who might even think the same way that I do. I'm really gra glad about that.